On December 12, 2015, Molly Rimmett Russell peacefully departed this life for eternity in heaven after an aggressive five-month fight with stage four melanoma. She was just 32 years old with a husband and three little girls who one day earlier had celebrated just their fifth wedding anniversary. Today, Molly's father, Bill Rummert, and sister, Lucy Strozier, share the powerful story of how Molly, her family, and the community that rallied around them, through faith, navigated the unimaginable. Welcome to A Stronger Faith, a podcast for those who question, wonder, and seek to understand. I'm your host, Stacy McCants, and we pray that God uses this conversation to move you in your pursuit of a stronger faith. Today's conversation deals with the sudden and devastating loss of a young mother, wife, daughter, sister, friend, and most of all, faithful servant of God. This territory deserves our most sincere respect. We're fortunate that her family has chosen to offer details of this painful and personal experience to continue to glorify God through the life and passing of Molly. So, December of 2020, so recently we just marked uh, the fifth anniversary of Molly's passing. And I can't imagine that enough time has passed where it's gotten a lot easier. I, I appreciate you being willing to share this story, knowing that probably each time you have a conversation about it, it, it still brings up a lot of emotion and, and some difficult things to remember and some pain with losing your sister and your daughter. Did you do anything in particular to sort of remember or commemorate with the anniversary? We have, um, especially I would say the one year anniversary we gathered and, and most, um, her birthday we gathered, um, her first you know, birthday in heaven and then her first year passing. And then I would say up until the fourth or fifth year, we gathered with the girls um, in Birmingham. The girls being her daughters. Her daughters. Yes, her three daughters. Right. And so um, maybe that first year we brought them here and then we went to Birmingham and were with them on the actual day, December 12th of her passing. How old was she when she was diagnosed she was 32 at that time the diagnosis was was melanoma is that correct yes that, that's correct um she had been uh, diagnosed with melanoma and had some melanoma removed from her head about five years prior to it being diagnosed in her liver, so she had a, a, a rough term when, and early on that um, an interventional, interventional radiologist uh, said in his report that she had innumerable lesions on her liver, and that, that was a, a, a tough word to uh, encounter uh, in those first week or two of uh, uh, her illness or understanding of her illness but um, Molly was was pregnant and she had just given birth to her third child in about a three-year span of time and when women are pregnant their immune system shuts down a little bit so that their body does not reject this new life in the womb and um the melanoma, which was thought to have been totally removed and good margins and all that sort of thing, obviously had gotten into her blood system. And while pregnant with her third child, her immune system suppressed. It was unable to, if you will, kind of ward off this melanoma. And the melanoma metastasized while she was pregnant. So her pregnancy masked symptoms that she might have 
recognized otherwise. She had two little girls, um, was busy caring for them. She was pregnant, so she was feeling not as much energy as she would have in the other pregnancies. She said, well, this is just the way it is when you have two little ones and you're pregnant with the third one. And she felt like after the baby was born that she would start getting some energy back and what have you. And it was about 30 days after the birth of baby Bess that um, she went to the doctor. They did an ultrasound. Uh, were concerned with what they saw at the doctor's office. And then she went on from there seeing specialists in the light. And, um, and then getting the diagnosis of, you know, innumerable lesions of uh, cancer, melanoma cancer on her liver. When was this? Um, yeah. Bess was born in late May of 2015. And did end you get of, the dates? Yeah, end of, end of June and or into early July of 2015. So she found this out end of June, early July of 2015. And so this was a six-month window between diagnosis and the end. So it was really fast. Yeah, really, really probably closer to five, um, but maybe five and a half or so. So how did she react on this news? I, I would say that you know, certainly there's an element of shock and then a lot of other emotions that um, she initially was thinking that this discomfort that she was feeling in her abdominal area was you know, maybe she was hoping that it was a gallbladder problem. And, um, you know, it, it obviously turned out it, it was not. So there was... Uh, I think just an element of shock at the news. I think uh, an element of fear of what all that might mean. And as things developed, I think great concern that that this could be a, a fatal situation. And so I think she had great concern for her husband, Rich, and, and her three daughters. I would think so. Did you guys understand the gravity of the diagnosis when it happened? I mean, a six-month, five-month turnaround is. Did Did you know that that was what was coming? Yeah, I, I think we knew. I, I, the The gravity of her condition became obvious. This radiologist who did this diagnostic procedure and also a a biopsy actually started crying when when he was talking with Molly at the end and and Molly somewhat practically but also somewhat humorously she said she said dad it's not a good sign when the doctor starts crying mm-hmm. Um, so I think that was an indication of the severity of things. And then early on, the, the, the biopsy led to some genetic testing. And if the makeup of the cancer was of a certain gene type or whatever, then she might be a candidate to take a, an inhibitive drug, an inhibitor, which would potentially beat back the cancer and there give us more time to look at other options and alternatives. But if she was not a candidate for that inhibitor, then she potentially would have died within weeks. So we, we were aware of that and very thankful when the inhibitor worked but also recognizing that the inhibitor typically works for maybe four to six months, and then the cancer figures it out, mutates or works around it, and um, and that it could be less based upon the tumor load in Molly's situation. 
So we, we realized that we had a, a limited window of time and we're hopeful that in that window, the inhibitors would, would work as they did. Uh, but we recognized that there was, you know, an end to that and hopeful that some other options might be available for at that time. This is just devastating news. I mean, completely kind of wipe out your world kind of news. I mean, beautiful, wonderful, mother of three, 32 years old, kind, generous from all the things I've ever heard about her, extraordinary woman, person, sister, child. This is the kind of thing it feels like that that can get people really uh, upset with God. This is the kind of stuff that we don't understand. And, and those are common initial reactions. Was there some of that? I, I know there was peace throughout the process just from what I know of it. But it, when did that happen? When did peace take place? And was there any of this frustration with God? I think as dad said, after her making it through those first few weeks, you know, and getting on the inhibitors, I think we, at least for me, we became hopeful at that point. You know, we said, okay, Lord, this is working and continue to remain hopeful, you know, until the end. And in response to your question about Molly's response, I remember Rich saying there at the end that he he did not hear her ask why. I, I didn't hear any anger from her. And for myself, I was not angry. I said, I don't understand, but never anger. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think that anger wasn't so much a piece of the package, maybe a desire to understand more Mm -hmm. was. And I know that I started digging back into some texts that I had studied at one point in time and and, um, seeking to find an answer to why bad things happen to good people and felt like I had learned some things, and, and shared that information with Rich and Molly. You know, in God's perfect will, within the Catholic faith tradition, which we're a part of, in God's perfect will, God wants everything to be good with all of us. He wants the best for us. But he also gifted mankind with the gift of free will almost an element of his divine nature that we have the ability to choose. And as a result of that, there is a lot of evil and sin in the world. And God allows, as a result of that gift of free will, he can't control everything for us. And as a result of that sin and evil in the world, there are some fallout from that and that bad things wind up happening to good people. It's not necessarily something that they personally or individually have done to offend God that brings on the wrath of God. It's, it's a consequence of this free will that God gives us. So it, it's not something intended specifically for them. They just are the receiver of this bad news. You guys had, you developed a Facebook page that allowed people that wanted to support you to at least be kept in form. And, and it was a ways for that communication. It's kind of a community, a community built. And I remember joining that you know, there were 8,000 and 9,000 and 13,000 and 15,000. It was like, it, it kept growing. And the message early on was clearly hopeful. 
hey, we're praying for a miracle for Molly. In fact, that I believe that was the initial name was Miracle for Molly. And a lot of a lot of people poured into that and, and you know, if you go to the page now, I think it's um it's praying for Molly Rimmett Russell. It is over eighteen thousand people that follow the page now. I, I, I don't know if you know that. You probably do or don't. I don't know. But uh, anyway, it's a strong community. And early on especially, and well, throughout, there was always hope. You guys were all bound together and just celebrated every great thing. And, and there was belief that a miracle could happen. A belief that a miracle would happen. Did that come from a decision that you guys got to that, hey, we're going to bind together and we're going to do everything we can. Uh, did this come from Molly? Where, where did the, when did the spirit of fight come in? Well, I, I think um, initially we, we were a people of prayer and we believe very much in the power of intercessory prayer, of being persistent in prayer and asking God for what we need. We also, in, in our faith tradition and most Christian faith traditions, believe in the healing power of Jesus. You know, Jesus is healing people right and left in the gospel passages. So the combination of those two things, believing in intercessory prayer and believing in the power of Jesus to heal. N- not necessarily just in those gospel passages or when he was physically here on earth, but that his healing spirit is still alive and working amongst people. And we know of people who have been physically healed. So we were, if you will, being persistent in that intercessory prayer on Molly's behalf that God's healing spirit be with her and that he might heal her of this ailment. Did change occur spiritually for her during this time? I think you have a story, Dad, of your conversation with her. I I, I can remember specifically conversations with Molly early on, and there became... uh, an element of acceptance over time that that she was critically ill and that it, it potentially could could lead to her not making it and passing away and she she had a very deep faith life prior to this diagnosis so for her personally she did not necessarily be, she wasn't concerned about her personal situation. She believed very much in Jesus and she believed very much in life after death and that life after death is better than what we experience here on earth, on our pilgrim journey here on earth. So I think she was very comfortable if she didn't die, if she did die, but she was a long time, several months, coming to acceptance and surrender to the idea that someone could take care of her husband and her daughters better than she could, or as well as she could. Mm. So she was several months coming to that point of surrender. And so that process of going, you know, not being concerned about herself and her own salvation, but being concerned about her husband and daughters, coming to the point where she was able to let them go and put them in God's hands was a, was a period of growth for her through this process. Did she tell you about that situation, what it was like, her struggles with with that? What, what got her to contentment with that? 
I think that uh, a, a key component was was her prayer and and her spending time in prayer, asking God to help her to understand more what was happening and to to recognize i th- I believe that that to to embrace the suffering and to recognize that the trial that she was enduring in her suffering was transforming her and that transformation i believe was a result of her surrendering you know her will was that you know i want to live i want to be here to see my girls grow up and what have you and over a period of months there was a continuous act of surrender of her will to whatever God wanted, whatever was God's will. And going back to God's will, there's an element in our Catholic tradition, you know, that God's perfect will and then there's God's permissive will. And God allows these bad things to happen to good people. And again, that's a function of him giving us that free will. He can't control everything and give us free will at the same time. And so she began to embrace God's permissive will in this situation. And so through that continuous act of surrender, she was transformed and, and came to know God in, in a new and deeper way. One would think that when you get to a place like that, where you understand that what's happening to you clearly is not how you would map it out, but that you also get to a point where you believe that through this suffering, good can come. All things work together for good for those who love him. Did she get to a place where she wanted to make it about affecting others? Well, I think it was a a process. As I mentioned earlier, in the beginning, our focus was healing, physical healing for Molly. And then as, as the Facebook page developed, the, uh, the concept was to, the more intercessory prayer on her behalf that we could get, the better it would be. And there was a, a point in time, I, I know in my own personal reaction to the Facebook page as it grew and, and more and more people were on it that I said, I don't know that I like this. And, and, and what I mean by that, there was a, a recognition that God was using that Facebook page and Molly's story to touch people's lives. There were people who you know, went to the doctor to get checked for a spot on their bodies and were diagnosed with melanoma as a result of Molly's story. So potentially their, their lives uh, saved from that. There were people that would hear her story and realize that they needed God in their life. I think a part of Molly's story is a recognition is that we're not in control. We, we think we are in control of things in our lives, but really we're not. And in a situation like this, it becomes blatantly evident that we're not in control, that, that God is in control, and, and, and we need to embrace that. So 
there was a, uh, an element of, of that in there. And as time went on, to, um, you know, I started saying, well, you know, God's going to use this for the greater good. He's going to use it for his glory. And hopefully that will come from a miraculous physical healing of Molly. But I began to feel in my heart that it wasn't going to end that way. That God was going to use this situation, potentially resulting in her passing and death. But that journey and that story would be a way for God to draw people into relationship with him. Did it change your faith? Definitely. I think from the beginning, I would say for me, it just, you know, continually to have an eternal perspective on life and still does to this day. Yeah, it, it very much changed and, and deepened my faith. I had an experience. I am a, a permanent deacon in the Catholic Church, and as a result of that, I play a role in the Sunday liturgy, uh, assisting the priest in, in that liturgical celebration. And I can remember specifically in prayer during that liturgical celebration and saying to God, you know, surely, God, you're not going to allow Molly to die and leave these three little girls. I said, surely you will heal her, physically heal her. But then there was a point of transformation possibly in me and then saying that, well, what if it's not God's will to physically heal Molly? What happens then? And then there was a recognition that God is mystery. And at times we just, through a lack of understanding, we just need to kind of a backwards, falling backwards experience of just falling backwards and trusting that someone's going to catch us. In this situation, it was almost a falling backwards experience. A falling backwards into God's mystery and expecting him to catch me in that instance. And so from that point on for me, that journey with with Molly and, and, and Rich took on a little bit different slant, saying that, you know, in my mind that I was hoping it was God's will for that physical healing, but if it wasn't, that I would be able to accept that and, and to help them as I could to accept God's will in this situation. If I am a doubter, if I am a skeptic, if I am a non-believer, I could say, I can say, he wasn't there. God wasn't there. I mean, you guys, we had half the city and people all over the country praying for healing. Not just a spiritual healing, but a but a physical healing. I mean, a, a, a real intercession and, and presence. And he wasn't there. Doesn't this prove that there's, I mean, what is it that you guys believe in? I, I, I can understand why someone would look and observe this situation in similar situations and say a thing like that. Was there a presence of God that you felt and saw that just wasn't reflected in what you prayed? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the, you know, the beauty of the body of the Christ that the people that surrounded us and cared for Molly and her girls and for Rich, 
through babysitting meals and then for for us as well um we we made a whole we have a whole list of god winks if you will of where god was there on a daily basis for all of us there was a, a an example i think and and molly and i and others believe that she did experience a, a, a bit of healing physical healing in the process and that early on in the first couple weeks maybe three weeks within our catholic tradition there's a there's a blessing of someone's home and a, and a priest or deacon in the church would bless the home and in the process of doing that we use water which has been blessed by a priest or deacon to sprinkle around the house symbolic of maybe the water of the river jordan that was blessed by Christ's divine presence in that water. And as I was blessing Rich and Molly's house, I also sprinkled holy water on Molly. And she said, whoa, I feel something happening. And she felt like that potentially that something might have been happening in her head. She had to scan the next day, and there was no sign of disease in her brain. Because melanoma would metastasize in the liver, but it would also oftentimes metastasize in the brain. And, and Molly felt like that she may have experienced some healing in that process. Probably three or four months later, we were in an examination room at Emory in Atlanta and a melanoma specialist was there and it was a checkup for Molly and, and um, the, what the specialist said, uh, she said, you know, one thing about your case that I'm just really surprised about is that you have no cancer in your brain, that, that the melanoma has not metastasized in your brain. And Molly cut her eyes over and and looked at me, and we we recognize we feel the divine intervention of God, potentially healing her if if anything that might have been in her brain, enabling her to fully function and operate to interact with people, to share posts on the Facebook page that shared the, the love and, the, and the, the message of Christ to those who were involved. That is amazing. I think about um, the decline that happens in cancer situations and the difficulty with which uh, the family experiences that you guys prayed so hard, and so many people prayed so hard for her healing. How do you come to terms with the fact that she didn't get healed? Well, I think for me, it um, is an element of surrender and conforming our will to the will of God. And we were petitioning, asking God for physical healing. And, and it's not a, a right. It's not something that we could expect. We were petitioning God. And, and I think there's a, there's a point in time in our prayer. I think there's something in maybe 1 John 4 where John says that when we conform our will to the will of God and our prayer is in line with the will of God, our prayers will be answered. And so there's an element of faith 
a big component of faith. It's saying, if this is God's will that Molly be healed, she'll be healed. And if it's not his will that she be healed, then it was not, you know, it, it was not his will. And then we need to accept the fact it was not his will and, and go on you know, with our lives and, and to, to live on from there. I remember Molly posting, I think it was Molly that posted this on the page. And I, and I don't think it was near the end. I feel like it was before that. I remember her posting, um, my grace is sufficient for you. Which sounds to me like she was telling everybody it was going to be okay. That it might not turn out the way we're praying for it. But that she was okay with it and it was going to be okay. And that she had peace. I, it, it was just the perception I had about this young 32-year-old mother of three little girls with her life ahead of her being taken from this world from a beautiful family that Christ followers love one another personified and that I felt like she led the way. That was my observation as a just an observer at a distance. I felt like she not only led maybe the family, but the entire community in trusting God, in being at peace with what, with what was probably not going to be what we were all praying for. That's how I felt. Does that represent how she was in the hospital room and in private time with family and with her kids? I think like dad said, it was a process, you know, for her. And then getting to that point of surrender of Rich and the girls and then feeling that peace. Yeah, I, I, I think she, she was at, at peace, as I mentioned early on, with just herself. And if it didn't work out, you know, her faith was strong enough to say, well, well, I, you know, I intended to live here longer, but if, if I haven't, I'm going on to something bigger and better. It, it, it's okay. So it was, it was just her responsibilities uh, that she, over time, maybe struggled with, you know, in, in, in terms of being at peace. I, I think there was peace, but there was always that nagging thing. You know, what's life going to be like for my family if I'm not here? And uh, maybe feeling like you're, you're leaving something undone uh, in terms of, you know, my, my job is to be a, a wife and a mother. And, you know, I'm kind of like I'm, I'm quitting on, on the job or whatever. And um, so I think it was a, a period of time that that peace that she experienced for her own well-being grew to the point where she was at peace with leaving and, and, and that God would provide for, for Rich and the girls. How did it change the family? You guys have a, a very tight-knit family. How many siblings are there? Five. Five siblings. I mean, you guys were in different parts of the country how did it change the family? I would say, yes, it strengthened all of us, you know, so five siblings and mom and dad. And even at the very beginning, we just rallied around her and wanted to be together. I think that I remember maybe the first or second weekend, all of the siblings came back to Birmingham to be with Molly and Rich and mom and dad were there and our spouses held down the fort at home so that we could have that time together so yes I would say it strengthened our bond um you know and as we had touched on you know deepened our faith did you change the way you prayed in this process I mean I know you prayed for healing 
did prayer life or did prayer change for you? I, I think for me, it changed from a standpoint of recognizing that oftentimes our prayer is centered on what we want rather than our prayer centering on what God wills for us. So I, I think in, in the Catholic Church this Sunday, there's a gospel passage that will be read throughout the world that a leper approaches Jesus and asks Jesus to heal him. But he prefaces his prayer by saying, if it be your will, heal me. So I think from a a change of the way we pray, there's a recognition of of praying and asking if it be your will, do this. And then if that prayer isn't answered, an acceptance of the fact that that must not be what God wanted for me. Yeah, Jesus prayed that the cup pass from him. <laughs> That's right. You know, and inside the prayer, and, and he, he, he didn't just say it once and then say, not my will but thine. He got there, but, but he asked several times. I mean, he went back after finding the guys asleep. He went back and prayed again and prayed again, and, and so agonizing in his prayer that sweating blood, and I can't imagine the intensity with which, I mean, he knew of his impending fate and how horrific it would be. And it took him a minute <laughs> to get to not my will, but yours. And, of course handled the in part with great dignity from what the gospel accounts reflect after getting to a place of peace did she have did you have vision of afterwards if she doesn't make it from this will come great good can you see stuff like that when you're in it or is that just something that you hope for and you see later on? I would say for me, I was more in terms of just, I, I had never prayed for something so hard in my life. And I was th- I was sure that God would heal her on this earth. So when it, when it came time, and I even remember at the very end at the hospital, when palliative care came in, you know, and they said there was no more you could do. I looked at Dad and I said, last night they said she could maybe go home. What do you mean there's nothing more they can do? So for me, I, I was not thinking that far ahead. I think Dad and his wisdom probably was. But for me, it just came to acceptance of, okay, Lord, you know, you have a different plan. And, and did I believe that God would be glorified in that? Yes. But how? I didn't know. Yeah, I, I think throughout the process, in, in the Facebook page being a big piece of that, there, there was feedback coming from people in terms of good things happening, of, of people's lives being changed and, and people being touched by what Molly posted in her deep faith and trust in God in this time of great trial. So uh, there was, I think, evidence of good things happening throughout that process. Um, And then I think when Molly passed away, you know, the shift became, you know, well, how do we, um, how do we help rich, you know, young father with three little girls, um, how do we help him? And so our prayer shifted, you know, to to what's you know what what do we need to be doing there, and 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 for God's divine intervention in that process. And and 
that resulted in, in many positive things happening in terms of people helping um, a great um, woman, you know, coming on board and helping Rich with the girls for a period of time, others doing that. And, and, and eventually feel like a divine intervention that, that Rich met Catherine and um, a, a wonderful woman and who has embraced um, Molly and Rich's three girls and, and loves them as her, her own. And, uh, and uh, they got married, you know, about 15 or 16 months ago. And um, it, it was a great blessing. So in that point in time when it may have been heartbreak and, and sadness that, our prayers for Molly's healing, physical healing here on earth were not answered. But also a recognition for me that our prayers for Molly's healing were answered, that Molly was totally healed. And I believe she's in the fullness of God's presence now, influencing as best she can you know, the situation here on earth. I believe that she she has something to do with Rich and Catherine meeting and this you know wonderful woman coming into the lives of her daughters and being there with them, you know, raising them day by day. You mentioned hearing of things, good things, extraordinary things, remarkable things happening happening uh, in people's lives that were related to Molly or you know, her comments or remarks or, or things like that. Is there anything that you can share? Well, there, there, there's many things, and probably we, we should have done a better job of, of documenting some of those things. But um, I think there's maybe five friends of Molly's, have, have maybe five, maybe more ch- children since then that they've, that they've named Molly. Um, and, and that's a function of the mothers of those girls you know being positively influenced by Molly's journey by Molly's faith and uh, in her sharing of that I think two more of like dad had mentioned earlier those that were you know either went back to the doctor or you know melanova was discovered so in terms of physical healing with their skin you know in regular checkups um, people certainly reached out in that regard and, and there's been other stories. There was a young woman that was a nurse at Children's Hospital, and she worked in an intensive care unit, and she took something of Molly's. was A rosary. A rosary, which is a tool of, of prayer in the Catholic tradition, and took a, a rosary that Molly had and and put it with this young child who was maybe near death palliative care and and uh and the child got better and and survived whatever it was dealing with there have been instances of people having dreams and and uh, experiencing interaction with molly in dreams one of the mothers who named her child molly was pregnant and she was anxious about how things were going to work out and and uh, she encountered Molly in a dream and and Molly told her everything was going to be fine didn't to not be anxious but just to trust in God and that's the way it turned out and um, as a result of that she she named her daughter Molly the same nurse that um was at Children's Hospital having a relationship with another patient and um the mother had lost her son and was having a hard time and this was still when molly was alive she reached out the nurse reached out to molly and said you know how can i encourage this mother and i think there were some scripture verses that were passed along and and she was the mother was then um turned on to molly's facebook page and I think the story goes that, 
you know, after the mother was having a hard time, the nurse reached out to the mother again and said, how are you doing? And she said, I'm so much better. Um, and mentioned that I guess in a dream she had seen a woman and she could not place her who was with her son in heaven. And the next morning she woke up and trying to place this woman and was on Facebook and was then saw Molly's picture and said it was Molly. So she had seen Molly with her son in heaven in a dream. Yes, that's my understanding. What are those stories doing to you when you hear them? Warming our heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just kind of, they're affirming, confirming, kind of what we believe, that uh, Molly is in heaven. And... Uh, feel a closeness to her that, um, uh, as Lucy said, warms, warms our hearts, deepens our faith, and creates a longing you know, to eventually be there with her, to be reunited with her. Any other ripple effects from this that you've seen even in the short five years since passing I would say that it brought, brought with me a, you know an element of the grieving process is uh, uh, some bargaining uh, with God and so this initial diagnosis of Molly was occurring in late June and early July and Here's a note that I made in my planner on July 7th. And uh, I titled it, My My Commitment to God. And it says, "If, if Molly is healed, I will accelerate my departure from the business that I owned. We had a succession plan in process and uh, of selling the business to Molly's brother and and uh, Lucy's husband, Barry. But then I would accelerate that process and begin to work more in full-time ministry. So that was an element of my bargaining with God, saying, well, God, if you give me what I want, I'll give you what I think you might want. So as time went on and after Molly died and a recognition that you know, our prayer for Molly to be healed was answered. It just wasn't answered in her lifetime here on earth. And a recognition, a spiritual moment of recognizing that, well, if this was a good idea, if this is what I felt like God would want, why, why does it change the fact that Molly uh, was not physically healed here on earth. So that that spiritual moment came to pass, and, and so I, I wound up accelerating uh, my departure from the business and, and left sooner than I might have originally thought of or planned. And I found that you know, I think to be in God's will and I'm spending more time working in ministry and you know, it, I feel like it's, it's, it's what God wanted to happen. And without the process of Molly's suffering and death and passing, I, I don't know that I would have come to that spiritual reality or, or spiritual moment of recognizing God's call for me to move more quickly. I think, too, after her passing and just more time for reflection, I think we were able to, you know, being removed, you know, being able to recognize how God was at work even before her diagnosis in terms of 
all of us living in different cities, as you had mentioned, but our older sister, Bess, being called back to Tuscaloosa um, June before Molly's diagnosis, and then for myself and, and my husband to be called home the May before her diagnosis. So here we were, God was already at work putting things into place for us to be back, to be here and to be available to help with her. And then, you know, after her passing to be able to help with Rich and the girls and um, that we could all be together. Yes, and and, and it it kind of spawned an effort um, and an idea with, with Lucy and Barry and Bess and Andrew moving back to Tuscaloosa from Atlanta, Luke and Adrian were already here. And it kind of spawned the idea, well, maybe, you know, maybe we just need to all live close together and uh, so that we can share a life with one another. And uh, so that that eventually happened. Um, the um, uh, We initially thought people might settle in a neighborhood that Luke and Adrian were living in and so when it was going that way, Patty and my wife said, well, well, if they, everybody moves out there, we're going to have to move out there. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but it turns out that uh, it didn't go that way, that Lucy and Barry and Bess and Andrew wound up settling in the neighborhood that we were living in. So at that point, uh, Luke and Adrian said, well, I guess we're going to have to move <laughs> over there. So, uh, uh, so we have four families living you know, within three quarters of a mile of one another in the same subdivision, sharing life with one another and recognizing the importance of family, family support, experiencing God's love present in each of us through one another, through family. And and uh, so there was a positive element that spawned out of the molly's situation and i can imagine the ripple effect from that through the lives of your children grandchildren and in perpetuity i guess that that that's a significant thing it seems like to me and um a lot of that probably gained a tremendous amount of steam through this experience with molly kind of looking back over the entire ordeal what things do you think you learned from it Uh, certainly a deepened faith and prayer life as we had already mentioned but I think too I think kind of what I had mentioned in terms of just the beauty of the body of the Christ a body of Christ of those that surrounded us and then that being our calling to be there for others that are in our same situation whether it's losing a child a sibling just showing up and, you know, being the hands and feet of Jesus like people were to us. I, I think, uh, you know, it's passage in Scripture, Second Corinthians chapter 1. It talks about consolation and how we, we have been consoled by Christ so that we then can go console others. I, th- I think that passage certainly has come to life and ties in very much with what Lucy was expressing there in terms of being there for others. I think um, an important moment for me in my own personal grieving process after Molly's death, I, I, was, I went on a retreat at a um, retreat house center, a Jesuit spirituality center, in Grand Coteau, Louisiana. And there they offer silent, directed retreats. So you're in an environment where you're silent and um, you spend maybe an hour a day with a retreat director. And the retreat director gives you kind of a homework assignments to work on and you, you know, read and pray with scripture maybe four or five times a day, and then come back to the retreat director the next day sharing what you've experienced. And in that process, in the, in 
dealing with my own personal grieving of, of Molly's death, he gave me a assignment that was a reflection uh, written by a, a priest, Father Henry Nowen, who is a spiritual writer and author of many books. And in that uh, reflection, Father Nowen talked about uh, a concept that we in our Catholic faith tradition believe in is the communion of saints. That that those who have died and gone to heaven are saints. You know, we've achieved that glory, and um, there are those that are here on earth, that all Christians here on earth are part of that communion of saints as well. And, and then potentially in our faith tradition, there may be a process of purgation, or, or preparation to be in the fullness of God's presence. So all those people in this communion of saints, and that we are connected with them through the Spirit of God, through the presence of the Holy Spirit in all of us. And that gave me great peace to recognize that I was connected with Molly by the Spirit of God. And so that, you know, while still here on earth, I, I could feel that. And also in our faith tradition, when we gather for a liturgical ser uh, ceremony, we believe that there's a, a transcendent nature of that liturgy where heaven meets earth. And God is, is present there along with angels and saints. So a special place of connectivity with Molly is during that mass, during that liturgical service, and, and, and feeling especially close to her at that time. I, I would imagine that had to be very peaceful and, in a sense, fulfilling. Absolutely. Uh, it, was, it was very, very peaceful to recognize uh, my connectivity with her, my ability to converse with her. Uh, this past Monday, I, I was involved in a, a funeral service at our church, and I actually gave the homily and made reference to that experience of coming to be more at peace with Molly's passing, recognizing that through the Holy Spirit that I am connected with her. Shared that with the family on Monday, prayed, asking, gotten, you know, in, in our church, we believe in the ability to ask saints to intercede for us. So I prayed before the service, asking Molly to intercede for me, that I might be able to share that message with the family. And after the service, and a family member come up and said, your words really touched me. And, and there was a process of connecting with some other things that he had been experiencing, and so that spirit of God, you know, was working there. That is really powerful. Um, if you had to deliver a message to others based on your experience, the experience that Molly had, what would that message be? I would say that I believe... Uh, the bet message would be to not be afraid of suffering and to not run away from suffering because it is in our suffering that we come to recognize things like we're not in control we think, come to recognize 
our need and dependence for God in our lives. And so it, the experience of suffering can be an express way, if you will, into a deeper, more meaningful relationship with God here on earth. So that suffering helps soften our humanness and enables us to recognize more clearly God's divine presence with us. When things are going well and we're not experiencing any kind of difficulty, we have a tendency to become more prideful and feel like this is all my good stuff rather than being humble and recognizing that everything that we have and all that we are is gift from God. So I would say that potentially before this experience, I might have said, well, you know, I don't know about that suffering. Uh, but I would say now that suffering can be a good thing to enable us to connect more intimately with God, to experience God's love in our lives. It happened to some degree in so many instances throughout Scripture. Suffering was critical in many cases for a new thing that needed to happen. I think of Jacob didn't become Israel until the fight with God and, I mean, hip thrown out of socket in some of his, uh, his own personal anxieties and as he's making his way back to confront potentially Esau. He thinks he's potentially going to die there. And that's one, I think, of Old Testament Joseph I think of Jesus also. And if you look throughout Scripture, suffering is, to some degree, plays a role in the spiritual life um, in, a, in a, big, a big part. And, and we don't do that. We, we, we avoid suffering at all costs. And I think, too, opening our eyes to those around us because... Everyone has some sort of suffering that they are enduring, you know, whether it's a chronic illness or I just think it's to just being aware of where you can be sympathetic to other people and what they're going through in their lives in terms of their own suffering. Is there another message from this, from, from your perspective, Lucy, that, that you would say to others based on your experience? I think... You know, acceptance of God's will, like we said, just, okay, Lord, you had a different plan and that he would use that for good. And we've seen that and we continue to see that. And I think, too, I think I mentioned earlier, just in terms of the eternal perspective, that that's our goal, right? So if you're keeping that at the forefront of your mind, and I think that makes you more empathetic, too, to the people all around us who are suffering in their own ways behind closed doors that we're not aware of. And then those that, that are in need and then you can go and take them a meal or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Sort of acting in the moment with an eye toward the eternal. Yes. I can imagine that you've got, um, an appreciation of that now that you could never have had without the experiences that, that you've had and, the way you now will take that to produce fruit for the kingdom. It, it seems, it feels like that's what you're doing. Just me watching you from um, the sidelines over where I am. Um, it's reflected, I feel like, in the things that you do and say. I know it's still painful, and I know it's a difficult thing. And um, the fact that you made the time to share that and sort of open the doors to 
what life was like in that experience and through that experience shows your commitment to the good that will come from a really tough situation. So I just want to thank you for your willingness to share. I know we've all prayed a lot about this in, in a, a situation like this. It's, um, I kind of call it holy ground because it's um, one of the most impactful things that will ever happen in, in your life to your own faith and, and your perspective on how we are to help make disciples of others. I, I just thank you for your willingness to share and share the insights that you've done. You're welcome. Thank you for, for having us. We'll never know the full magnitude of Molly Rimmett Russell's impact for the kingdom of God. I was just one of the more than 18,000 social media followers with no connection to the family back in 2015, and Molly's story stirred me to my core. It also unmistakably moved me closer to Christ. And if I'm honest, Molly's story was a significant inspiration in the founding of this podcast. I would never attempt to coach anyone on how Molly's story might impact their faith because there's just so much in it. But I hope you're moved to draw closer to Christ without delay after hearing it. I'm pretty sure that's what Molly would want. Thank you for joining us today on A Stronger Faith. Without people like Bill and Lucy who are willing to share their faith and experiences for the glory of God and for the benefit of others, us listeners would miss out on some powerful blessings. If you know of someone who might have an experience or story that could help strengthen the faith of others, consider reaching out to us. You can email us at connect at a stronger faith.com. You can reach us on Facebook, Instagram, or on our website at a stronger faith.com. I'm sure you have some ideas and I hope you will consider helping us. Until next time, I pray for peace and a stronger faith for you and those you love.